this test shows you exactly why you shouldn't migrate your automations to OpenAI's new agent builder, at least not yet, but it also shows that it's very good at one thing. So OpenAI just dropped this and everyone's panicking, asking if their NAN and Zapier systems are now completely obsolete. They're worried they need to migrate dozens of automations and start from a blank screen. So after building over 150 automations, I immediately tested if it could replace even one of my core business systems. It failed, and it all comes down to these four missing features that make it unreliable for any serious business. In this video, I'll break down the full test and show you the one use case it's actually really good for. So let's go into the OpenAI interface at platform.openai.com forward slash agent dash builder and anyone can access this and let's get our first workflow set up and they very handily point out exactly what they should be able to do and exactly what they shouldn't be able to do so that we can make a direct comparison to NAN. So we're inside the interface here and it says to create a workflow and we can build a chat agent workflow with custom logic and tools. So it's very clear that this is at the moment only for chat agent workflows. We know that it's integrating agents and we know that we can integrate external tools and they have some really handy pre-built workflows that we can run through and show you how this compares directly to NAN, show you what it's designed to do and what it's not designed to do so that we can make a direct comparison of whether this will be a great competitor in the future and whether it's a tool you should add to your portfolio. So we've got six different templates here and they're rather simple workflows. So we've got data enrichment, which is all about answering user questions. We've got a planner helper. So a multi-turn workflow for creating work plans, customer service, which is a slightly more complex use case here, a structured data Q&A where we can query a database using our natural language, document comparison, and an internal knowledge system. So let's start with something extremely basic and you can see the direct comparison inside this workflow. So along the left-hand side, we have a similar interface to NAN here where we have the canvas, we have different blocks, although they're rounded, and we have these core nodes, tools, logic, and data. So they might be named slightly different to how NAN names things, but the concepts are exactly the same. We've even got the sticky notes, so they definitely take an inspiration from the top workflow builders like NAN and Zapier here. We can drag away around the canvas and we've got a trigger here. And whenever we click on one of these nodes or blocks, it will come up with all the different variables and all the different things we can edit inside that block. So for example, for the trigger, we've got an input variable which shows here, which is just our input as text. So we've got a text input going into this workflow and then being passed along sequentially to the web research agent. Now the web research agent sounds like it's a specialized agent, but actually all it is, is this core agent block that you can either click or drag onto the canvas here that's been given a name about its specialism. So it's effectively like taking an LLM chain inside NAN and adding custom instructions to the prompt for that node. We've got everything the same as we have inside NAN. We've got the ability to remember chat history. It's a bit easier to do here because we don't have to put a memory box on it. We can choose the model and we're limited here at the moment to just OpenAI models, which makes sense because it's a tool by OpenAI. We've got the reasoning effort, which isn't something we directly see inside NAN, but it's something that we can adjust in the details of the LLM chain or the model inside NAN. We've got what output format. So this is actually a bit cleaner than NAN because we have, do we want to output in JSON, for example, and we can add a schema directly in here, or do we want the output to just be text? And then most importantly, we've got the ability to connect to tools here. And the only way this would be able to compete with NAN is actually by connecting this to MCP servers for specific tools. So we've got the general connections here, like file search, web search, code interpreter, but the real power is if you're able to connect this via an MCP server to one of your apps, i.e. giving it context of the data that you use in your business every single day. So we've got these third-party servers like Shopify, Stripe, Intercom, etc., And these are probably gonna stay quite basic, similar to the connections that we have inside Claude or Gemini or OpenAI itself. They're gonna be quite basic, but allow us to access certain data that's inside our business. And we can filter by OpenAI or by other developers up here. If we were to connect one of these, it's actually super straightforward. So we're gonna connect Gmail here. We'll give it a description, Gmail MCP, and it asks for our access token here. So we just have to click on the button here to get our access token. It can take us to this special page, which is all about defining the scope of that access token. We give it the scopes that we want it to access here. So what we can do is control F and type in Gmail. And we've got the Gmail API v1 here, and we can tick any of these scopes that we want to give it. So we're allowing it to insert, add labels, compose. And then once we authorize, it's gonna basically connect to the appropriate account. 
select all of these to give it the appropriate scopes and it will provide us with an authorization code which we can then take back and put in confidentially inside here where it's stored securely and you can see that when we connect this it shows all of the tools that we can access inside for example our email here so we can batch read emails we can get our profile get recent emails read emails and search emails and everything you add in the scope will appear here so we add that connection here and then suddenly this agent has access to that tool now the real differentiator between this workflow and something like NAN is the ability to access thousands of tools. And that's where this is not quite up to scratch yet, because actually if you were to compare this directly, this is all about connecting agents directly to a specific set of business integrated tools like Gmail, Outlook, calendars, etc. And you can connect it to external MCP servers but it requires a little bit more technical know-how to actually set up these MCP servers. I've not tested it myself yet, but the flexibility is there. However, you are at the mercy of MCP development rather than NAN, for example, who integrate all of these great nodes that we can plug and play to all of our systems. Now back to the agents. On here, you can see, for example, for this web research agent, which is just a specialized agent, that we've put effectively some context in here, which would be the equivalent to putting in a system prompt inside NAN. So in exactly the same way like NAN, we add our context and need to define the inputs in here. So for example, we're passing in an input inside here, so we can add the context, but we can see directly that we've got one input, which is in input as text, which is the workflow text we're passing in. And you can see it uses the same conventions as NAN with the double curly braces. We've just got workflow dot input as text, which is the variable that we defined earlier in the start. And that is how we pass it through to the web research agent. And then the next agent is just a summarize and display the information that's received from the previous output. And if we click on add context here, you can see that it automatically pushes us to click output text on here. Now the one area that it surpasses NAN in terms of the output is actually we've got these different output formats. So not only can we do text and JSON, we can also use this very cool widget and it gives an example of how the widget would be displayed and allow you to display this and deploy this on a website, for example, whereas the built-in NAN chat system is actually quite rudimentary and basic. So if we come up here and publish this, it gives us two methods to actually deploy this properly in production. One is using ChatKit, and they've got a complete ChatKit start guide on how to actually integrate this workflow that you've now created into and embed it into a, another website. And the second is actually taking the TypeScript code or the Python code directly and actually integrating that into an external site. So it's fantastic that these can be hosted externally. Now we've talked about some of the core nodes, but let's now look at more complex use case where we incorporate some logic and some data as well. So if we go back and we go to the templates again, let's look at a more complex use case, which is customer service. Now, one thing I really like about this workflow builder is they've actually kept it to the bare minimum, which is like the least confusing 20% of things you need to know that form 80% of every workflow. So I've done a video previously about the 13 nodes that cover 80% of NAN and outside those 13 nodes, you could learn thousands of nodes, but actually the logic is all built into those 13 nodes. They've taken this approach with this first version and we'll see how this adapts over time. But you can see on the left-hand side, these are all the nodes we can use. And then we've got variables and then we've got data inside the nodes. So they've literally selected the top three nodes for each section. And that makes it significantly easier if you're coming from something like learning to make your own custom GPTs to actually building out an agent like this. And I would say agent is a strong word here. It's more like an LLM chain. If it was an agent, it would be actually thinking back and forth and passing data back and forth. Whereas if we've just got it something like a classification agent where we've not connected the dip to any tools and there's no back and forth thinking. This is closer to just a traditional chat window with an LLM chain. But we've got some additional things that it's important to reflect on. The first is this guardrails. So we've got this jailbreak guardrail and inside the instructions here, of course we define the input, but it also gives us some really important information that actually again, it's decided this is super important for businesses spinning up these. The first is that it detects and redacts personal identifiable information. So if we don't want to pull in any of that information into the agent, into OpenAI's cloud-based systems, then we don't need to. We've got some rules on the back end that classifies and blocks harmful intent. So we can make sure that nobody is abusing the workflows that we're putting online. And also by default, it detects any prompt injection and jailbreak attempts that try and steal your data or try and get your system to do something that it shouldn't do. And again, we don't have to define these rules like we would do inside NAN. They're all set up on our behalf. And they've got two other things around hallucination and continue on error, but the others are more powerful for our use case. We're able to define 
does it fail and therefore take a different action? So we have deterministic workflows that we can build out here. We then have our classification agent classify the user's intent into the, one of the following categories, return item, cancel subscription, or get information. And then we're able to put a larger condition, which is built more like if you were actually learning to code rather than not learning to code. So maybe it's a bit cumbersome if you're not technical and you're starting this from scratch, but it breaks it down into very simple to use branches. So it's an if else block, which says if the classification is return item, then take this route here. If it is not that, but it is cancel subscription, then throw it into the retention agent and take that branch. And if it is not that, then use the get information, which presumably will go back to the user to get more information. And if we look at the information agent, you're an information agent for answering informational queries. Your aim is to provide clear, concise responses to user questions. So at that point, it's split it down into three separate agents that have different tasks here and you can give those all different models depending on what they need to do and all different tools depending on what they need to access. Comparing this to NAN it's much quicker to set this up because we only have to worry about those system instructions and it predefines everything that goes into them as well as gives easy access to define the most important things very simply on the right hand side. But the important bit here is we're classifying and using this if else block to say actually we should take different actions based on our input. We then have a continued flow for the return agent. And the return agent is all about offering replacement devices with free shipping. So where we need a human in the loop, this is significantly simpler than NAN because actually we can just use this user approval block that goes back and sends a predefined message like does this work for you? Or we can add in context and make it a custom message from that return agent. We then get yes or no and then that ends the block. Now obviously we would not just end the block there because we need to confirm with the customer certain details around their order, et cetera. But it gives you a flavor of actually how you start building these out, similar to an NAN workflow. We spend most of our time inside NAN doing data transformation. So it's great to see that they have this transform step, which allows you to actually take data and manipulate it in certain ways. However, it's designed for more technical users. And you can see that because it's got these expressions here, which are JavaScript expressions. So you actually need a little bit more technical knowledge than if you were starting with NAN and trying to actually do some of the predefined blocks here. But they've traded off simplicity in number of actions you can take with slightly more complexity in how you can actually set these up for your use case. And they're very developer friendly. Now, one thing that's really cool that NAN actually need to take a look at is looping and going back and forth while a condition is true or not true. So in NAN, you've got the loop where we have it basically sequentially looping until an action is taken and then it's done. So we have to implement several steps if we want to wait for an action to, taken, to, to be taken. Say we're calling an external API and we're waiting for that file to be generated. We have to call that API. We wait a minute, we call it again, we wait, we wait, we wait until the status is correct. Whereas here, we have this actual block that wraps around other blocks that says while a condition is true, we will continue to actually take that action on your behalf. Now, the downside of this, again, is it takes a little bit more coding background to actually learn how to implement these itself. You can't just drag and drop it on top of a certain action, and maybe that's an improvement they need to make. And I hear that NAN is also updating that loop node. So who knows, this may be the similar thing to what NAN decide to do with that loop over items node. So let's publish that as a custom service workflow and actually show you what the outputs are like and how the interface is to interact with this. An important note here is you need to make sure you've verified your organization to actually deploy and test it. Then once we're verified, it gives us this preview option. We can see our workflow and actually see it exactly how it, how it works. So we can pretend to be a customer here, enter a query. And what you're going to see is actually that information go through and pass the stages. So it's really cool how it lights up the different stages here, as well as shows us at each stage exactly the output. So it's not a very user-friendly output, but it's a good testing output because it shows us this is what happened at the jailbreak guardrail. It was viewed as safe. This is what happened at the classification agent. It took this action. And then the return agent then responded us to us. We're sorry to hear you'd like a refund. To assist you better, we can offer a replacement dive device with free shipping instead. Would you like us to receive with sending a replacement? We're now at the user approval stage, so it's asked for our approval, and that's cool how it happens in the chat. 
whereas previously in something like NAN, it's more complicated. So we have to loop it round with human in the loop. So we hit yes, and we get a response message as a JSON in here. Your return is on the way. So again, not the most user-friendly workflow, but really powerful that we can see all of those actions take place on the screen. Now let's reflect on how this compares to NAN and if it's going to establish more market share than something like NAN, which has been gradually growing or exponentially growing over the last couple of months. And I've broken this down into some of the things we've seen today. So you can connect to external business systems using the OpenAI Agent Builder. However, you need to use MCP servers, which if you've used before, you'll understand they're built by other users and often unreliable and have not really been adopted at a significant scale to this point. Self-hosting and data control. Now, this might not sound very important to you, but businesses really care about their own data control and actually hosting their own data. They don't want to send their personal system data because it's valuable into OpenAI and have them manage that. So the fact that we cannot self-host this means NAN has a clear advantage for enterprise businesses. Complex multi-step business workflows. So you saw very simple chat use cases or quick isolated AI chat tasks that perform very well in this environment, but we don't need an AI agent for everything. And we've got deterministic workflows a lot of the times that require much more logical thinking, more steps, and the ability to build out different conditions than the ones that we have on offer. Now it's great that it's simple and has only a few offer because that will help other people adopt this and be beginners and pick this up more easily. But if you're used to building out larger problems, more complex workflows, then NAN is still the go-to here. We didn't really get into error handling here, but I know the power of something like NAN with error handling, but I'd argue that there was visual workflow debugging and control here. We saw as the steps went through exactly what was happening. So I'd actually say both of those use cases are tick. Now, is this going to dominate NAN because OpenAI has such a massive market share? Who knows? But right now, NAN is still the front runner for building our agentic systems, particularly when we are connecting up multiple softwares where we require tools like MCP servers. Now, if this was helpful and you want to check out more about NAN, then we're going to link a video that will take you from completely zero in NAN through to building out complete agentic systems. Thanks for watching. Please give it a like and subscribe if you enjoyed the content.